Each successive year, we find ourselves looking more closely at our intertidal friends. And the closer we look, the more we are fascinated by the complexities of these animals and the ways in which they adapt themselves to life in harsh environments. Hi, my name is Joel Small. In an earlier video, Barnacle Reefs of Puget Sound, we explored barnacle aggregations and their impact upon their habitat. For this report, we selected a most nearly normal individual specimen of karyosis, one which has been unimpeded by crowded conditions and therefore able and free to assume its structural norm. So we take our investigation to a new level, that of taking apart, disassembling the external shell of our nearly normal semibalanus karyosis. In this video, we deconstruct the shell of an especially nice large acorn barnacle. We borrow the word deconstruct from engineering because we take it apart in a way that helps interpret its structure and function. But first we need a little background and context. There are four common acorn barnacle species in our study area. We will learn how to easily distinguish the thatch barnacle from the others. In other words, we show you how to recognize semibalanus cariosus when you see one. And along the way, we may learn a bit about barnacles in general. In the world's oceans, barnacles are abundant wherever they can find something solid to attach to. The specimen we feature in this report came from the lowest intertidal zone, where conditions are, evidently, just right for the species. After several stages of preparation, our karyosis is ready for disassembly. It now looks like this from above, and this is the view from below. Before we continue, here's an outline of where we are going, including the time code for each section. By the way, you may find this glossary useful. Several weeks of preparation have reduced our specimen to its calcified plates and the tough membrane connecting the operculum to the wall plates. In this sequence, we remove the operculum as a unit by cutting along the opercular membrane's contact with the wall plates. We pause for a few seconds to identify some of the major components. Don't worry, we will look more closely at these individual plates later. Excision complete, we turn it over, give it a tap, and it falls out. We'll get back to the operculum in a couple minutes, but first we will turn our attention back to the wall plates. For illustrative purposes, we show, with a different specimen, how easily separation is after thorough preparation. Not so with our featured specimen. Fortunately, we have specialized tools. But it isn't pretty. We reenact the disassembly here.
The fit is so precise, it's still a bit difficult. The inside of the plates and their names. Here's an outside view of the same wall plates. The plate at the left is actually a pair. We couldn't separate them for fear of breakage. The one at the right should have separated as indicated with the red dashed line, but fractured along the green. And now, as promised, we get back to the operculum. We've talked about the wall plates and how as a unit they provide a very strong barrier. Barnacles have a very complex integration between their rigid shells, the plates, and the animal within. But an animal must have means for interacting with the external world. The operculum, little lid, is the gateway between the animal and its environment. There are three functional positions for the operculum. Fully closed, slightly open, fully open and extended. Let's take a look at a lateral cross section. The opercular membrane, shown in blue, is very elastic. Interestingly, when fully extended, the base is a bit larger than can be accommodated by the interior dimensions of the wall plates. We'll look at this and other curiosities as we disassemble our operculum. The operculum is the gateway for all body functions and a tight seal against external insults. We're going to take it apart in a minute or two, but first a couple comments about this individual specimen. Its operculum is in most ways typical of the species, but the small barnacles on the external surfaces are unusual. This suggests the individual was comparatively inactive and near the end of its lifespan. We cut the membrane, first between the opposing pair of turga. Then between the scuda. In this manner, we are reducing the operculum unit to its constituent pair of tergum scutum. Each tergum scutum pair is a functional unit, their common margin forming an important hinge. The structures of terga and scuda are more complex than we might have imagined. When the operculum is closed, fibrous tissue on the inside edges of the plates completes the barrier between the animal and its environment. Here are the same pairs viewed from the outside. In this view of our liberated opercular plate pair, we can see the membrane has survived specimen preparation and remains flexible if not stretchable. The next step in reducing cariosis to its individual plates is that of separating turga from scuda in each pair. On the inside, at the point of plate contact, is a fibrous mass that binds them together and serves as a simple hinge. Cutting this hinge frees them. Mm -hmm. 
Some residual debris from preparation still keeps them together, but they are easily snapped apart. resulting in this image of one pair external and the other internal. This sequence shows how they fit together and articulate. Seems to be a lot of complexity for this very limited range of motion. Our collection of karyosis plates is complete and shown here as a reminder of their relative sizes. For the benefit of karyosis enthusiasts everywhere, we take a last look at the opercular plates in high resolution. Let's pause here for a moment. The opercular membrane is elastic, thereby allowing some range of motion. Karyosis are sensitive to light changes. As we approach, the animal will pull the plates downward, causing the plates to close tightly and rock forward. 